Thank you so much, Ariane. Before any of you head off to your next session, I just want to ask a question. How many have, of you have used hand sanitizer today? Okay, a fair few. How many this week have used hand sanitizer? What about this year? Should be everyone, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and maybe past two years since COVID. Everyone. What, what about five years ago? Who already had hand sanitizer part of their daily bag? Okay, you, you guys are dedicated. You too. So I think if you were a part of the crowd that were already using hand sanitizer five years ago, you really have um, this gentleman to thank you, Didier Pitté, because he is known as the promoter of hydroalcoholic gel, which we call hand sanitizer. And I know that you wear many hats, but that's one that has been uh, more talked about in the last two years especially. So let's start with you. Um, ha hand hygiene, incredibly important part of your work. You were traveling all around the world trying to promote the fact that people should wash their hands, should have clean hands. Suddenly, the pandemic came. What immediately came to your mind? Did you think, I told you so? <laughs> I didn't told you so about the pandemic. We all were waiting for a pandemic at one point, and we actually sustained a pandemic before in 2009, and it was H1N1, and at that time, the alcohol-based hand rubs or gels or sanitizer, whatever the name you use, were used, in fact, in the community, but not as much as they would have during the COVID. So when the COVID situation arrived, actually, we could already anticipate. If we come back on 2009, what we did as hospital epidemiologists in charge of patients in hospitals, when we saw the H1N1 coming and when we could fail that the alcohol-based hand rub would be used in hospitals, but all, also in the community. We call the company producing alcohol-based hand rub and say, listen, you have to produce the alcohol-based hand rub in priority for hospitals. Because it was very clear that we needed to continue to protect our patients. And it was also very clear that companies producing alcohol-based hand rub would never cope with the demand worldwide. And this is exactly what happened again during the COVID-19, in fact. It seems so common sense that we should just care about hand hygiene. When that became part of the spotlight, I know that you had a crazy and busy schedule. You were on trains, you were traveling, you were going to France and, and many places in Europe. What did that change in terms of your work? Well, technically, uh, at the, the beginning of the pandemic, I was in the hospital, like many other of my colleagues, and we were working day and nights. And of course, hand hygiene was one of the important action to recommend, as well as protective equipment, environment control, and so on and so on. So we were fully and totally busy into this part of the work. But of course, people came to me and say, isn't it that uh, gels would be useful for the community? And say, yes, of course, but uh, we would need more. So what happened immediately is that people turn to the, I mean, WHO, the World Health Organization formulation that we developed for actually the need of developing countries at the beginning and started to produce the alcohol-based hand drop solutions by themselves. And then, of course, these people were perfumers, distillers, pharmacies, and people from all over the place in developed and developing countries using the technologies that were actually available. Because remember that when we proposed to the World Health Organization, not only the formulation, we also proposed the recipe. So people could actually produce the alcohol-based hand gels easily. I remember this very clearly when even breweries were switching up uh, their services and starting to produce uh, hand sanitizer. I think uh, what would be good for the audience to know is that you're also an epidemiologist, you're an infectious diseases, diseases expert, you're not just promoting hand hygiene, <laughs> but tell everyone how you got into this because I know that yeah. the background, you were supposed to go down another path. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. You know a lot. <laughs> now, in the, in the background, if you want, uh, well, the, the other way I was thinking about in my very early life was to go into becoming a priest, which finally I, I didn't choose, but went to medicine. Then I went to internal medicine as a regular doctor, and then to infectious diseases after some research in the lab and so on. And then actually my training was more into preventing healthcare associated infection than into all sorts of disease prevention. But of course in my training, I went to Africa to work uh, in, in refugee camps. I went to work in different places, different hospitals. But then I was hired by the hospital to become what we call the hospital epidemiologists. The hospital epidemiologist is the person who is there to prevent infections. And I had the privilege to have a group of nurses with me and we went to the wards and we looked at the practices for hand hygiene. Because hand hygiene is the number one prevention strategy in hospitals to actually reduce healthcare associated infections. Healthcare associated infections in hospitals worldwide are responsible for 16 million deaths every year. This is more than malaria, tuberculosis, and, and, and AIDS together. You see, it's, it's the number one priority in developing countries, the number, one, number two priorities in the developed, uh, in our world. So, by looking at the practices at the bedside with what I call my team of nurses, we realized that we were absolutely unable to match and to cope with the demand of hand hygiene if we would be using soap and water. Mm. Because it takes too much time to wash hands, you know, with soap and water. You go to the sink, you use the water, then the, the soap, then you... Yeah, like sing the, a song Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure, yes, <laughs> actually, it, we, it's the time to sing a song that you, you have to mm. need to wash your hands. And then we realized that we needed to change what we call change the system. So find a way to clean your hands much faster than by using soap and water. And at that time, I thought about using alcohol-based hand rub. Why? Because there was some alcohol-based hand rub in the laboratory where I was trained in microbiology, but we were not using it because it was really mm. badly tolerated for the hands. It was not appropriately made for your hands and nobody used it and nobody used it in the hospital. So. In 1994, we started to change the system, recommend the use of alcohol-based hand rub or gels instead of soap and water, together with a, a, a promotion strategy that was multimodal and so on, with mm -hmm. funny and posters and performance feedback and so on. And after three years, we could demonstrate a reduction of 50% in healthcare associated infection here in Geneva mm -hmm. at the University Hospital, together with the fact that we were saving lives. Uh, just because of this system change what, that we introduced together with the different tools. So that was the beginning and that was the start for the gels to be used in hospitals. Then we were lucky, we published our results, we were visited by many people from around the world, and hospitals started to do the same all over the world. And now here we are. Where it's and here we are, <laughs> and the assessment is, uh, since we started to do a campaign for WHO in 2005, mm -hmm. the assessment is that we are reducing with this campaign the equivalent of 8 million deaths a year, curbing the, 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 the 16 million deaths mm -hmm. by 50%. So we are saving a lot of life with this very simple change in behavior together with the system change that we introduced. I think it seems you went down uh, a good path in the end. You managed to popularize the use of hand sanitizer, which has incredibly changed the way we've viewed hygiene uh, in the past two years. So during the pandemic, you were also called upon, you were doing a lot of interviews. Um, now, France also asked you to come and assess their COVID strategy. Did you meet Macron? Did he ask you? Um, what were your findings there? Yeah, of course. Well, actually the story is the Director General, Dr. Tedros from the World Health Organization asked during the World Health Assembly in May 2020 for each country 
to do uh, and look at the management of the crisis in each of the different countries. This was at the beginning. That was at the begin uh, three months into yeah. the pandemic. Then in June 2020, six months into the pandemic, President Emmanuel Macron asked me whether I would be prepared to uh, drive and lead a team of experts that would actually revisit the management of the crisis uh, by the French government in comparison to the other government in the world. Mm -hmm. And this is what we did. And we actually took one full year to return a report to Emmanuel Macron, uh, comparing the different handling of the COVID-19 pandemic in different countries according to different parameters. We look at health issues like mortality linked to COVID. Uh, we looked at economic issues, at social issues, and at actually regulations into country, as well as political systems. Because actually, as you know, the pandemic is a very holistic problem. Mm -hmm. And actually, we should not call it a pandemic. We should call it a syndemic. If you want, we can discuss about it. But yes, Emmanuel Macron actually received our report. We had 40 recommendations for France to modify mm -hmm. actions into the government and to better uh, be prepared for the next pandemic because there will be a next pandemic for, for sure. And uh, a tenth of those have been implemented. A, four, mm -hmm. a quarter of these recommendations are currently in implementation and the rest will be for the, for the future. And of course, there are recommendations that are on all directions, not only in the field of health. I read that you were traveling a lot between uh, Switzerland and France, but also sure. to many other places. So sure. what was your assessment from that? You were assessing France, but it was yeah. in comparison yeah. to many other European well, countries. Well, technically, I, I lived half of the year in, I mean, half a week, every week in Paris. Okay. From Wednesday to Saturday, I was in Paris. Rest of the time, I was in Geneva. I had the privilege to have a fantastic team here in Geneva handling the crisis so I could meet with my team quickly and everything was easy to go. Then we, I visited several countries. I visited Hong Kong at the very mm -hmm. beginning of the pandemic for very specific issue. Then we visited several governments like Germany, Denmark, Sweden, uh, and so on. We did uh, video conferences with ambassadors all over the world. We met with uh, CEOs of big companies try, uh, working all over the world. We, meet, we, we met with different peoples mm. so that we sort of could have a general idea of the handling of the pandemic mm. in all of those countries. And of course, we gave particular, particular recommendation to France uh, as, as expected. So every country right now is at a different stage. If we look at Switzerland or if we look at some parts in Asia, uh, this recovery is moving at a different pace. But I know you recently gave a lecture or a talk and you said you talked about it for an hour on the topic alone of what is the new normal going to look like? Oh, are we back to normal? What does normal mean to yeah. you now? Well, you know, psychologists were very <laughs> upset to me when I said uh, somewhere in May 2020 that we won't kiss each other for the next two years. <laughs> because they say, wow, you are foolish. You should not mm. destroy hope among people and so on. But that was actually the case. Well, how could you say that? You could say that because when you realize that a new virus, it's introducing itself into your viroma, so into the viruses that you are living with for many, many years, it will obviously take time. Mm -hmm. It will take waves and waves and waves to do it. By chance, we had vaccines that could actually reduce the number of waves, but we knew that it will take some time. So the question is, what is the cause of these changes? What is the cause of the pandemic? This one, it will be too long to discuss it, but what are the causes of pandemics in general? Well, the causes are that we are living in a world in three cycles. The host, yourself, myself, animals, the bacteria, the virus, the fungi, mm -hmm. second, and the third is the environment. And the intrication in the, of these three are making the pandemics. Climate change is changing the way viruses are living on Earth. Chikungunya, uh, dengue, and, and Zika are linked to uh, a specific 
uh, virus mm. that is actually moving with the change in temperature because viruses cannot keep their same, what we call homeothermia, as humans. Just to give you an example, biodiversity is in probably largely related to the way that actually uh, the, the coronaviruses that lives in the small animals are changing because biodiversity is changing. And of course, population living together, too close to each other, together with animals, and so on and so on, are making this change. And last but not least, the viruses, the bacteria, the fungi, have natural resistance to spread, natural resistance to antibiotic, antivirals, and drugs, and also capacity to be cross-transmitted mm -hmm. once they become human viruses. So all these make pandemics be a reality today and probably and certainly a reality tomorrow. Knowing all that we know now, seems that we've made so much progress. People say that there was a lot of innovation during this time. We never saw vaccines being produced so quickly. Knowing all that, would you say that we do have a good toolkit to prepare for the next pandemic or are there still a lot of open gaps well, to be filled? Well, let's be very clear. We were not prepared and we failed. We should, we should be very clear. We were lucky because the virus actually hardly infected children at the beginning. It had changed before, uh, after that. But we have been lucky. We have been lucky in the story and we failed. So now we have to take the lessons of the crisis. So to answer easily to your question, mm -hmm. are we ready for the next one? No, we are not. We are not. And I told you Emmanuel Macron gave us this mission. We look at the way the country handled the crisis. At, in 2021, at the World Health Assembly in May of last year, among the whole 194 countries that were supposed to come back with a report, only eight came. And mm. none of them were looking at economy, social, society, and so on, the way we did it. So I don't know about this year, return, I know about the report that had been written in, in some places, and I think that there is a huge amount of work mm. to take the lessons from this pandemic in order to be better prepared for the next pandemic. Okay, Mr. Peter, just to challenge you a bit, just because we, you say we're not prepared for the next pandemic doesn't mean we're not moving closer or becoming more prepared. If we take the lessons, we will be mm. better prepared. We have seen many things that didn't work, mm. but now we have to have the courage, whether scientists or politicians, and probably community, to go to the next step. You know, we, are, we have uh, sort of asking, we are asking about what we call medical democracy, which means that we want patients to participate into our decisions. It failed in most of the countries mm. around the world. It is still failing now in some country I will not indicate mm. for obvious reason right now. But it's very, very clear that we were not prepared. We didn't do so well. We failed on many respects. We certainly learn in theory, but now we have to really come to real stories mm -hmm. and to real interventions and to real preparedness to be better next time. And to finish on, let's say, a more uplifting note, if you had to pinpoint one thing that the pandemic really benefited or changed you for the better, what would that be? Well, I think that we have uh, realized how much, how much solidarity could be important, could be even better. We have, re, uh, we have rely on states. We have came, come back, we, ca we came back to states of affairs and uh, clearly the governance of this world need to be worked. You know, asking WHO to handle such a pandemic is too much. And WHO failed in many regards in this handling of the pandemic. We need to, to ask the United Nations we need a United, United Nations meeting, the same way we had one for AIDS, we had one for Ebola, in order for chief of states to sit together and mandate missions so that we clarify who is doing what and how to do what 
for the near future. Now, at the single person level, I think that we have understood that basic principles in life are so important. Remember at the beginning, I told you that we should not call about a pandemic, mm -hmm. but about a syndemic. What is a syndemic? It's together two di diseases going on. One mm -hmm. being an infectious disease, disease, coronavirus, COVID-19, this time for the pandemic, and the world of inequalities, inequalities in health, mm -hmm. in economy, in society, in political systems that are so important. And once the pandemic is here, it's like a projector. Mm. And once the virus is here, it's a projector that shows you all the failures in economy, in health, in access to health, in society, and so on and so on. So this is what we have to understand. A pandemic is coming, an epidemic is coming, but actually it's a social disease. It's a huge social disease and it's not only an mm. infectious disease. So that's why we need to take these lessons you know, to, to, to go forward. And the chief of states are certainly the ones that are the most important. Looking at Europe, the Europe of health failed totally in mm. this story. There was no European health concept. Europe was not made for health, but nevertheless now it has to move to the next level. And same at the level of the world, of course. Well, um, Mr. Pijay, we've covered so much territory, but I know we could go on even more. But for now, I'll leave it for there. I think everyone's going to rush off and, and hand sanitize <laughs> their hands. <laughs> but um, just for everyone to know, for our next session, thank you very much thank once you. again. Thank you. For our next session, which was with uh, Bertrand Picard from Solar Impulse Foundation, that has unfortunately been cancelled. But good news for you, you might have a, a long... Huh? He will, he actually, a surprise for you, he will be here, uh, but just uh, in 10 minutes, as I've just been told. So if you want to stick around for that, that's coming up very shortly. Otherwise, we will be back here in the same room for the opening ceremony that's going to be at 6 p.m. So remember to come here for that. And let's give a round of applause to Mr. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.